psalm. We're going to read the entire psalm, but it's only seven verses. For those of you who read your Bibles through from front to back, you know that the book of Psalms is somewhat easy reading. The verses are shorter. They're written to be sung. And you just know that it, it's easier to read the book of Psalms than most books of the Bible. And Psalm 11 is a wonderful psalm. It's got a one particular verse in it that I've preached on a number of times through the years. And I want to preach from this verse again. I am so broken hearted about our country. It may not look like it when you when you see me, you know, I tell people, they say, how you doing preacher? I say, fine as frogs are split in three ways. And I am. I told my computer this morning how good I was. Yeah. You've heard me. I'm saved by the grace of God, kept by the power of God, led by the Spirit of God, sanctified by the truth of God, and soon to be caused to the clouds by the Son of God. Yeah. My computer asks me every morning, how are you? That's what I tell it. <laughs> so if you ever come by 5111 Poppy Drive and you hear some strange sound, I'm talking to my computer and I'm trying to get it converted. It's up to Windows 10, but I don't know that that's the right conversion it needs. <laughs> Psalm 11. Would you stand with me, please? Psalm 11. You say, well, if you're broken hearted, how do you keep going, preacher? By faith. You say, if you're broken hearted, how can you have a smiling countenance? Well, the way I can is I rejoice in the Lord <coughs> all the way. Yeah. And again I say, rejoice. Say, how do you keep going, preacher? The joy of the Lord is my strength. If you have Psalm 11, beginning with verse 1, the Bible says, In the Lord put I my trust. How say you to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. Now folks, don't be surprised if that happens to you. The devil's children may give you a hard time. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. That's the entire psalm. I'd like to draw your attention to verse number 3. By the way, what a blessing to see people that have continued to come in. Amen. And I haven't been able to pay attention to everybody I'd like to, but what a blessing to see. See, Brother Jimmy's family, more of them come in. Amen. Since we got started, God bless you. Love you folks. Verse 3 is our text for the message. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father, rescue our country. Dear Lord, Rescue our churches. Dear Lord, if there's any lost person here, rescue that unsaved individual as we endeavor to present the gospel, the way of salvation to them. Father, if there's a Christian here that is getting wayward, a Christian that's dabbling in sin, a Christian whose heart is wandering, dear Father, rescue them. Lord, may this be a real homecoming for someone who needs to come home. For someone who needs to find heaven as their home. For someone who needs a church home. For someone who needs to come back home and serve God again. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. 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 Be seated, please. I am not very knowledgeable in a lot of things. And one thing that I don't know much about is construction. I have helped. I've been a carpenter's helper. and I've dabbled in things. I used to live out in six acres of woods, way off of the road. 
And so it didn't hurt anybody if, uh, if I made a mess trying to build something back there in the woods. I had a trailer we converted into a shop, and I had all kinds of things that I fooled around with. But one thing that I'm told is, is true, and that is, is if you want a structure to last, one of the essentials for the building is its foundation. The foundation needs to be right. If you're going to skip on time and quality or diligence about anything in the building of a building, probably you wouldn't want to do that with regard to the foundation. The foundations help determine whether or not that the building is going to be able to endure just the wear of time the stress of being occupied by people who don't care whether the building lasts or not, and the onslaught of severe weather conditions. The furniture of a home can be beautiful, but if the foundations are faulty, the building will eventually have severe problems. Some of you people have seen houses and buildings, especially out in the country, but you've seen them in the city as well, that have deteriorated and collapse. The adornment of a house may be ornate, but if the foundations are weak, then the structure will not last. Our text asks the question, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The great institutions of society may be compared to a building. They all have structure of some sort. And if the foundation for these institutions are, are not right, then the institutions are going to be in serious trouble eventually. The foundations of America look like that they are in trouble today. And if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let me say that America may not have ever been what we would call a true Christian nation, such as the nations of this world will be when Jesus actually rules the world from Jerusalem for a thousand years in what we call the Millennial Kingdom or the Millennial Reign of Christ. But our country was based upon Christian principles and Biblical principles. The Word of God and the Christian faith were instrumental in our country's foundation. They were instrumental in influencing the people who wrote up the paperwork by which our country is governed. Today, we've left the Word of God. We have left those Christian principles. We've turned our backs on God as a country. This morning, I want to bring you a message called Come Home, America. Come Home, America. About two weeks ago, my wife and I were out and about, and I said to my wife, this is not the America I remember. This is not the America I know. Today is a day of rejoicing. God's been good to this church for 94 years. I rejoice at every homecoming. Thank God. Do you rejoice at your birthday? You say, well, preacher, I don't count them anymore. I don't like them. I thank God for being good to me every birthday comes along. I'm very grateful. Our church's birthday comes along. I'm very grateful. I'm a very happy camper. Plus, I like y'all's cooking. But on the occasion of our church's 94th homecoming, I'd like to, as one preacher, one small-time preacher in a small-time church in a small-time section of a great big old town in a great big country, I'd like to call America to come back. Amen. Come back to God. Sure. Come back to the Bible. Amen. Come back to the foundations before they get destroyed. Sure. The foundations that made us great. You might say that we need to get back to the basics. Yeah. I teach a Sunday school class that the class is called Bible Basics. I believe that the basics are what is most important in your life. I said it this morning in Sunday school, it's great when you find someone who has learned some additional tricks. 
Come on, Brother Allen, you play the piano. You've learned all kind of neat tricks. They're embellishment. They make somebody sound better than they are. And I'm not saying anything about his ability. He certainly can play. But the basics is what is really important. However you're going to learn to play the piano or whatever, whatever you set down as your basements is what's going to set you up for the rest of your life. Your basics is what's going to set you up in music, in, in all kinds of things. That's what you're going to build off of the rest of your life. You can tell a difference. I can't, but people that know music can tell a difference from someone who basically was trained on the piano on a particular way of learning to play the piano. Sure. You can tell if somebody was trained by Jerry Lee Lewis, for instance. <laughs> we need to get back to basics, America. Yeah. We need to come home. I'm just going to mention a few things that are dear to me that I'm concerned about in our country. And if God will help me, I'm going to raise up my voice until the Lord calls me home. We need to see a return to the basics. Come home, America, about the subject of conversion. I'm talking about salvation. Our deacon emphasized and said that that's one of the main emphases of our church ever since our church began, was salvation. Getting people saved. Getting the gospel out. Brother Chris War, one of our missionaries, been visiting with us some while he's been here. That's what we believe in. We believe in getting God's gospel out here and everywhere else yeah. that we can. Dearly beloved, a person's foundation for his conversion is either going to take you to heaven or hell. Sure. If your conversion, if your salvation is based on something that is not real and is not biblical and is not God approved, you're not going to go to heaven. And somebody says, well, preacher, i got just as good a chance to, to go as you do. Or as a woman said one time in, in, in anger toward me, she says, I'm just as liable to go up to heaven in a fine saucer as you are. <laughs> she's wherever she's gone now. She's either with the Lord or she's in that other place. But no, you're not as likely to go except... You go one way. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In John 14, 6. And in line with our text this morning, let me say that the Bible says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus. Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11 is what I just quoted to you and that verse says that's the only foundation that will make it. I say that it's the only foundation that make it in life but for sure Jesus is the only foundation that can get you to heaven. We need to get back to the basics about that because he that hath the Son hath life and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You've got the Son, you've got life. And there are many people who have different ideas about how you get the Son. But let me just say that the foundation in conversion is basic. And we need to get back to the basics about a miracle that takes place in a person's heart that's supernatural when he gets saved. Salvation is not an ac academic matter. It's not an educational matter. Yes, the Bible does use the word know and knowledge with reference to trusting Christ and getting saved. But when you get saved, it's kind of like one hymn writer put it. People have tried to express what it's like to get saved. One, one songwriter wrote it this way. Heaven came down. And glory yep. fill my soul. Yep. You do not have to have any particular kind of feeling to get saved. But when you trust Christ, it's a miracle. Yep. God, thank God for, for 
physical life. To me, that's a miracle. The Bible says that children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Family that used to visit our church just had another young this past week. Young and number seven. By the way, I was thinking about it. I may have left it out of my announcements. I got so messed up here. But in the same week, we had one of our dear ladies go on to be with the Lord, Sister Mary Long. And in the same week, a dear family that used to attend this church had a new baby come into this world. I want you to pray for those that are left behind by Mary's departure. And I want you to pray for families like this one, Ross Grant's family. They had a little baby boy named Gideon. And uh, they've had all their children, I believe all of us worked out this way, uh, at home with midwife. And guess what? This is one of those where the midwife didn't make it. So guess who had to be there <laughs> and deliver that baby? Ross himself. I want you to talk with him and ask him how that went. <laughs> I don't care whether it's even an animal. There's something special about a birth, isn't it? Yeah. There's something special about it. And with a child being born into this world, a human parent, there's something godly about that thing. The fruit of the womb is His reward. Dearly beloved, if that's a miracle, how much more is the new birth a miracle? Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Need to get back to the basics about a message that is clear. There's one message that brings about the new birth. And it's the message of Jesus. That message is not about how bad you are. You are bad. Mm -hmm. Preacher, how are you going to ever get people to come to church telling them they're bad? It's not my job to get people to come to church. My, it's my job to please Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm trying to reach people with the truth. And the truth is, you're too bad to go to heaven. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. You say, preacher, you're insulting me. I'm quoting Scripture. Why is that? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every man at his best state is altogether vanity. There's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Those aren't the thoughts of Brother O'Neill. That's what the Bible says. And the message that saves a person from his sins is this. Christ died. For our sins. According to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And he rose again the third day. According to the scriptures. Now that's the message. You can think about all that you want to. About what you're going to do to get you to heaven. But if you get to heaven. It would be simply because. From the heart. You believe that message. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation. To everyone that believeth. To everyone that believeth. To everyone that believeth. Yeah. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Yeah. Say, preacher, you're preaching easy believism. I don't believe in easy believism. I believe in effortless believism. Yeah. I believe that you're saved by grace through faith and that not yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. As I've tried to tell you before, it may be hard to lift this pulpit. And it may be easy to lift these cheaters. Yeah. But it's still a work yeah. to have to lift them up. And if you don't believe that it's a work, you wait till you get arthritis someday and try to pick up something you used to lift easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> and, you'll, and you'll find that, that, that there is some effort involved. Right. There's no effort involved in getting saved. Amen. All the effort was done by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. God works today when a message is preached like this one or when somebody goes to someone's home and gives the gospel to them. God works in the heart. But there's not one thing, there's not one effort, not one, one, one sweat, a, 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 a drop of sweat. There's no effort whatsoever in you getting saved. Jesus paid it all. You work after you're saved because you're saved in order to please the one that saved you. But it has nothing to do with whether or not you're saved. We need to get back to that. Yes. Baptists need to get back to that. You say, well, you're giving people a license to sin. I'm not giving them a license to do anything. Yeah. I'm telling you, this is...
this is the good news. Amen. You're wicked. You're headed for hell. The good news is you don't have to go. Amen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Fifty-two years ago, as a 14-year-old boy, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. By faith I came. He took me in. He promised me that if I'd come, he'd never cast me out. It's holding up pretty good. Fifty-two years! I believe He's going to keep me through all eternity. My plea is that He shed His blood for me. If that don't get me in, I'm not going in. Because that's all I'm depending on. Is the blood of the Lamb. Folks, I think that's the foundation. we got to get people who are more confident in God's salvation and in God's saving power, God's keeping power than they are in their ability to please God in some way. Folks, you don't get saved by figuring out how to do things that God's happy with. You get saved by trusting in God's beloved Son. We've got to get back to a return or return to the basics about a method that's simple and scriptural, and that is by grace through faith. Not works. We need some political leaders who are saved. We need some businessmen who run businesses in Jacksonville who know the Lord. We need mothers and fathers who have been born again by the grace of God so that they know how to love each other and so that they can know how to bring up children. I want to say secondly, we need a return in America to the basics of character and responsibility. You say, a preacher, you can't just straight out and straighten out a nation. I know that, but somebody, somebody needs to speak the truth about sin and a nation. I don't think it was written in the Bible as a filth when the Bible says, righteousness exalteth a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. That's Proverbs 14.34. You want to see a nation go down the tubes? Let that nation decide that they don't want God to interfere with the education of the children. Let that nation decide that it's okay to kill little babies in the womb. You don't see a nation go down the tube? Let that nation decide that it is a legitimate marriage when two men decide to marry each other. Righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Our words show our character. Our works show our character. Our ways show our character. And if you think that the economic problem that we're going through because of this shutdown is bad, America has gone bankrupt when it comes to character. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> there was a time when a man's word was as good as his bond. If you heard him say it, I realize there's always been liars. But there was a time when it was an honorable thing for a man just to keep his word. But it got to the point to where you had to nail him down and make him sign a sheet of paper. And some people, if they couldn't write their name, they put an X. And somebody saw him write that X and they knew that man would pay that debt. Somebody looked at a piece of paper and had a great big X and a little X next to it. And he said, what's that little X about? He said, oh, I'm a junior. <laughs> you think about that? <laughs> Now, you have to sign eight pieces of paper, 12 pieces of paper, 15 pieces of paper. 
And they want your photograph and your fingerprints. They may want to put a chip in you eventually. Yeah. Third, I'd like to see a return to the basics. Come home, America, in couples and marriage. Amen. We are we are at the point where we're just about got more people living together outside of marriage than being married. That's true. We're about at that point. Yeah. This week I gave somebody this verse, I believe. It says, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. That's, right. That's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Dearly beloved, the idea today is, is let's try things out, and if it goes well, then we get married. That's not God's way. Amen. The way it is for God is to dedicate yourself <laughs> to God first. Right. I heard of somebody here recently related to our church folk that they got engaged after four years of thinking about it. Yeah. Well, at least they thought about it. Amen. Consider it. Make the decision to do it. Yeah. And the only safe way to make the decision is for two people to believe that's what God wants them to do. Amen. And that they're doing it not just because they're in love, but they're doing it because they want to please God. Amen. One of the best wedding invitations I ever received was sent to me by a family where somebody I knew was getting married, somebody out of uh, the Navy. I believe that's who it was. And the invitation said, had their names on the front, and it says so-and-so and so-and-so, believing it to be the will of God, as well as their own desire. Mm -hmm. Invite you to join with them in their matrimony. Listen, dearly beloved, the Bible says, except the Lord build a house. They labor in vain to build it. Brother Hewitt, that's a great place to meet a future wife. Amen. Is that a Bible-believing church? Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah! I think I was about 13. I saw this pretty little girl. She was sitting on one of these wooden, little wooden chairs that they used to have in Baptist churches. Anybody remember those? Those little wooden chairs, you know? And I don't know if it was made out of straw that went between them or what it was. And she was sitting there, and boy, I got up all the courage I could muster. It was this close. Well, it wasn't this close. But we were both a little smaller back then. And she was thinking, who is this little boy? Thank God, God saved me. Same church I got saved in, I got baptized in. Became a member. I met my future mate. We got married in that church. And dearly beloved, we need to get back to that kind of a relationship. Amen. People finding the Lord. Finding the one that the Lord wants them to have. I'm talking about couples in marriage. We need to get back to purity about marriage. I'm talking about before marriage, people ought to be pure. These days they've got some kind of, have you, don't they have some kind of a jewelry or something that's supposed to be an abstinence type of thing? Abstinence? Ab Abstinence rings or Purity. necklaces Purity and things ring. like that. Purity, Purity rings. And, uh, and it means you're keeping yourself pure until marriage. Amen. We need to get back to that. Sure. We need to practice courtship, not shacking up, Amen. to decide whether or not we want to get married. Mm -hmm. And then when you get married, we need to be pure and be faithful to one another. Sure. The persons in marriage are the Lord, who is the hope of the home. Mm -hmm. The husband, who is the God-ordained head of the home. The wife, who is the helper of the husband in the home. And the children, who are the heirs to the home. That's pretty simple. Yeah. But we need to get back to that. Yeah. Let me say that when we think about returning to the basics in couples in marriage, we need to emphasize the permanence of marriage. Amen. 
I don't believe. I believe there's. I believe there's biblically grounds for divorce, mm -hmm. sexual un, sexual uh, unfaithfulness, fornication, adultery, whatever you call it. But I believe when two people marry, they ought not to marry to try it out okay. and see if we like it, and then we can always end it. Yeah. We didn't make any prenuptial agreement. Neither one of us knew we'd ever have anything. But we didn't plan to end it. We didn't plan for what's going to happen if the thing doesn't work out. Yeah. I married this woman so that we could be in the nursing home together. <laughs> Permanent. I'm not saying that God doesn't give people a second chance. Thank God for His grace and mercy. But we need to get back to telling people you need to get saved. You need to pray for God to give you the one He wants you to get married to. Yeah. You need to marry that one. Yeah. And then when you marry that one, stay married to that one. Yeah. Through the ups and downs, the thins and the, and the prosperity times, just stay together. Yeah. Work it out. Yeah. Yeah. Grass may look greener on the other side until you get there and have to start mowing Marriage is simply this. In God's way, one man for one woman for life. And again, shacking up is not marriage. Go ahead and make the commitment. Make the covenant. Amen. Say I do, say I will. And then after you do it, do it. Make up your mind, you will. Another thing I'll say we need to get back to with regard to that is homosexuality. That is not marriage. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination, the Bible says, Leviticus 18, 22. It's not marriage. In case this gets on YouTube, it ain't marriage. It's abomination. That's what the Bible says. We need to see a return to the basics finally among Christian people in America because we're the salt, we're the light. We need to make a difference. And we need to see a difference in Christian people in a return to the basics in a commitment to serve God. Sure. Christian people are not as committed to serving God as we used to be. Yeah. Joshua 24, 15 is still on the doors of some Christian homes. And some of you know that it ends with these words, but as for me and my house, right. we will serve the Lord. Now folks, we need to get back to this. A man and wife need to make a decision at the very beginning. They need to, need to decide, decide, we will serve the Lord. That's going to be hard if both of you don't make that decision. It's going to be hard to have a home that serves the Lord. Some of y'all know what it's like to just be one of you serving the Lord. It can be pretty miserable in your home if you get both of them, make the decision. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hey, would somebody do that today? Will you come back? Come back home, America? It needs to be decisive. It needs to be dedicated. You need to just step out, do it, stick to it. And when you serve God, I believe you ought to be delighted once you've made the decision. I've never regretted doing right. I've done wrong and regret it. But I don't regret anything that I did that was right. I believe you ought to do what's right because it is right. Whether it feels good or not. That is, I believe in duty. But I tell you what's a real blessing. Is when doing right is not only a duty, but it's your delight. Somebody says, well, if I believe like you believe, preacher... I'd stay out of church just as much as I wanted to. You say that what you do has nothing to do with it. Well, when it comes to my born again part of me and my new nature, I do stay out of church just as much as I want to. Brother Joe, do you know I drink liquor just as much as I want to? Sure. I rob banks just as often as I want to. I was about to say I killed people, but I hadn't killed everybody I wanted to. <laughs> 
But the truth is, as far as the new man, the new birth, the part of you that's born again, praise God, when you get saved, that part wants to do right. Some of you don't may not, may not know about the difference between the old man and the new man and the two natures of the believer. But dearly beloved, it's a blessing when your duty becomes your delight. And as some people have quoted to me when they've come into church early on Sunday morning, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I remember the impression it made on me. The first time, many years ago, I went to a place called Chick-fil-A. Went through the window. And after I got my food, I said, thank you. And the little kid up there said to me, it's my pleasure. I drove away thinking, I never heard anybody say that. <laughs> when I gave them money or when I got my food. He said, it's my pleasure. It's almost like they were glad I was a customer. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Like to go into a place and you feel like they think they're doing you a favor because they'll let you buy something. Yeah, that's right. So why are you here, preacher? Why are you still preaching? You could be retired. Because this is my pleasure. Yeah. My duty has come my delight. As one fellow likes to say, it's a joy when your vocation becomes your vacation. Say amen. amen. Will you help America come home? If you're away, will you come home? Yeah. If you haven't ever got saved, come home in conversion. Yeah. We need some people in America who come home in character and be better. Sure. We need some people who <coughs> follow God's rules about couples and marriage. Sure. We need some Christians who make a commitment. That I'm not just here for me to see how long I can live and how much I can enjoy myself while I'm going to live. Brother Chuck, you and I have talked about it. From here on out, let's make a difference for God. Amen. Let's commit ourselves with what we've got left, however old you are. It's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Will you stand with me, please?